ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Duke Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you very much. I'm very blessed to be here with you tonight, this Sunday night here. Uh, for me, this first teaching of uh, my new administration, if you want to call that, my time here at headquarters. And I was very blessed to have the invitation to share with you. I'm very thankful. And I've got a specific topic here that has maybe two titles. The first one, I suppose you could entitle it, Can Others See Christ in Me? Subtitled, Do I See Christ in Me? Because others will only be able to recognize the Christ in us as we move about as living epistles if we first recognize the Christ in us. And what I mean by recognize the Christ in us is not just the acknowledging of it. Yes, I know. I have Christ in me. whoop de doo <laughs> It's not just a fact or information that you gathered somewhere or somebody passed you a note and said, hey, it's Christ in you. <laughs> it's none of those things. It is a reality that we must discover and continue to learn from and develop in that knowledge and that awareness to really operate the full potential of it. First of all, I'd like you to turn to a very familiar verse. I trust all of you, Romans 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 6, right? <laughs> no, verse 9. Verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. A very familiar place to those of us in the way ministry. Romans 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is the verse that we, that we read, that we study, that we know from the Word of God that gives us that salvation, that gives us that uh, privilege to be born again of God's Spirit. Once we have God's seed in us, once we are born again of God's seed and have that Holy Spirit in us, Colossians chapter 1, another very familiar verse, gives us the background of some of the greatness of that seed within us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That new birth, you know, was the mystery hid from the beginning of time. And as that mystery became known that Jews and Gentiles could all be born of the Spirit of God, the greatness of the, or the riches of the glory of that mystery was made available to those individuals at that time and to us today, the greatness of Christ in us. Now, it's that Christ in us and what it all represents that we must recognize and that we must put on in our minds. And I'd like to cover with you a few keys to recognizing that Christ in us to, so that we can live it to a greater fullness. And I'd like to cover specifically the who, what, when, where, and why of this. First of all, the who. The who of recognizing that Christ in you, helping you to recognize that Christ in you. The who represents or stands for who you hang out with. This is very important in recognizing that Christ in you. One time when I was living in the state of New York, we were very privileged to live in an area that uh, very close to our house was a pasture, a grazing land where they had some cattle. There were about 20 or 30 head of cattle out there, and among all these cattle was one horse. An old mare that was out there with the cattle just to graze and to enjoy life. And every day you'd see them walking together as a group, moving around, just having a great time. Until one fall, uh, got to, it was getting a little bit cold in the fall, and they decided to move the cattle out, put them in barns for the winter. So they came in one day and they took all the cows out 
and they left the horse in there. Now, the horse had a hard time with this because all during the night he was running all around the pasture trying to find all the cows. He was, uh, you know, whinnying and all, whatever you call whatever they do, I don't know, uh, making a lot of noise, looking for the cattle. And the next day when I got up, I saw him pressed against the fence, calling out to two cows about across the road, about a pasture and a half away, trying to make contact <laughs> with something that perhaps that mare thought it was, a cow. It had, been, it had been so involved with cattle that he thought he was a cow. He could, I mean, the, the mare, I keep saying he, but the mare could not figure out why it was left when all the other cattle were taken away. It hung out with them. It saw them day after day, grazed like, now perhaps didn't look like them, didn't walk like them, uh, didn't exactly act always like they did, but what the heck, I hang out with them all the time. I must be one of them, even though it was a horse. So you got to watch out who you hang out with. You see, because that impression is going to be, be very deeply rooted in your mind. And if we will hang out with those people who recognize that Christ in them, it will help us to more recognize that Christ in us. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says, be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, and separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I, will, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians 5. And verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. And that phrase is a little awkward here in the Revised Standard Version. It reads, not at all, meaning all. What he's saying is, uh, uh, I'm not talking about everybody. I don't, I'm not exactly saying don't, for, you know, don't fellowship or don't company with Every, all the fornicators of this world or the covetous or the extortioners or with idolaters for then must ye needs have the first ticket on the space shuttle. <laughs> You're going to need to go out of this world because they're everywhere. You know, uh, you can't just totally withdraw yourself from society where I don't want to fellowship with them. They might, they're idolaters. They're, I can't be with all these people. <laughs> then you'd have a hard time being employed in this world. Uh, you see, you've got to you you you're going to have to deal with unbelievers on occasion. Uh, I thought about this today as we were I was I was flying in from some place and happened to hear some of the radio contact. And I suppose you've got a believer pilot and he's taking off and the tower says turn right and go to three thousand. And the pilot says I'm not listening to him. He's an unbeliever. You're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> You see, uh, so there are times when you have to deal with unbelievers and the people of this world in order to not deal with them. You'd have to leave the world like it says here. But verse 11, he says, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is uh, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such an one do not or with such an one not know not to eat. In other words, don't hang out with them, don't fellowship with them, don't continue to be around them. Because they are going to 
limit your view again of that Christ in you. You hang out with believers that continue to exhort that great, the greatness of that Christ in you, you'll be in better shape. Look in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. I'm sure all of these are pretty familiar verses to you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Those are the people you want to hang out with. If you are going to more recognize the Christ in you, these are the people you want to hang out with. Those who are going to speak good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer, that the hearer receives the greatness of that grace and that blessing to encourage him to a greater understanding of that Christ in him. If you hang out with cows, you start thinking you're a cow. If you hang out with believers who continue to magnify that Christ in them, then that's what you become and that's what you begin to develop in your life. So that's the who. The what. What is the next key? The what has to do with your mind. The next thing in recognizing that Christ in you depends on what you feed your mind. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is a, a great verse. I, I caught myself one time because I, I said, turn to this verse, and I said, boy, this is, this is one of my favorite verses, or this is my favorite verse. And then I started thinking about it. That's like saying, you know, rum raisin is my favorite haagen -Dazs. I mean, every haagen is good. So how can you say one is better than another? I don't know. So, I mean, one verse, how can it be better than another? But this one is exciting. Maybe I could, I know I could say that. This one's exciting. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is how we watch over our minds. That we watch what we feed our minds. Somebody told me a couple of days ago their idea of health food was lettuce on a Big Mac. Now, <laughs> you know... That's a little shaky, I, I admit. You know, but that was their thinking, their way of thinking, so I don't, I don't know. But here, casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. We have to watch what we feed our minds. We have to watch what we feed our minds. We have to, to guard our minds and see that it gets the proper nourishment with respect to the greatness of the word that's addressed to us so that we can more clearly see who we are, that we can identify who we are. Keep your place here and look at Colossians. Colossians, uh, I just thought about this, but this is a, a great one. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection, your thoughts on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead. Now that could make a person stop to think. You know, you read something, I mean, this is about me. Here I am. I am dead. Okay? That's interesting. What else? And your life is hid. Now that makes it a little more interesting. Now I'm dead, but my life is hid somewhere. If I am now dead, but my life is hid, I'd like to find out where it is. Okay? If I can find out where it is, then I will no longer be dead. Okay? So, ye are dead and your life is hid where? With Christ. Right? Hid with Christ in God. What is the subject of the Word of God from Genesis 3.15 through Revelation? Jesus Christ. So if my life is hid in Christ, where is a good place to find it? In the Word. Let's see. To feed my mind on the Word to, that'll give me that proper nourishment so that I can more identify with that Christ in me, that I can see it more brilliantly, that I can live it more fully. 
So back to 2 Corinthians. Here it is, guarding your mind. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. A lot of times I like to look at the word figuratively or imaginatively or whatever. Put it in visions in my mind that relates. To give a more dramatic picture of what these scriptures are saying. When it says casting down imaginations, and that doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have an imagination. You know. It's talking about reasonings, thoughts, those things which are contrary and against the word of God. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So what I do with my mind is, here's the way I picture this verse. Here, I'm thinking something that is contrary to the word. Okay, so... If I identify that, that what I'm thinking is contrary to the word, you know, and I know it's contrary to the word, but that's what I'm thinking, you know, and I got it in my mind and that's what, that's the way I want to be right now. That's the way I want to think. You know, I know the word says this, but you know, I'm just, I'm tired of thinking the word all the time. I just want to think this. I mean, it feels good right now to think this. Okay. So I'm just going to think this. So. If you identify that what you were thinking in your mind is contrary to the word, then what you have to do is put yourself in this place. You have to realize that it is an imagination or a high thing, a reasoning that has exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So what you do is you picture God standing in front of you, whatever figure you want to make it to be, and you picture yourself nose to nose, eye to eye with God, because you have exalted yourself up against the knowledge of God. And you picture yourself looking in God's eyes and saying, God, you don't know me like I know me, and you don't know what's good for me, so you don't know your head from a hole in the ground. Now, if you can get by that, go ahead and think that way. <laughs> I've never been able to go that far, you know. When I get to that point and I, and I picture myself looking at God and saying, my thoughts are greater than your thoughts, I always back out. <laughs> you know, I've never been able to go that far spiritually. <laughs> but, <laughs> so you've got to really think now what the word says, you see. You don't want to exalt yourself against the knowledge of God because God's wisdom is more far-reaching and greater than our wisdom. It's easy for me to understand as a parent. You know, I tell my son, hey, it's 7.30, time to go to bed. You know, it used to be, uh, well, one time when they were, we were doing some stuff, it was 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock was the magic number. You know, we go, I'd ask my little girl, what time is it? 8 o'clock, time to go to bed. It was one phrase. It just, that was just one phrase. You know, 8 o'clock, time to go to bed. So when I tell them it's time to go to bed, my son is totally convinced that he knows his life and he knows what's good for him. He realizes that I have made a, a, an error judgment, uh, you know, judgment or error in my judgment. He realizes that eight o'clock is not the time he should go to bed and that for his life at this point in time, it would be greater for him to stay up. Now, he has, a, he has taken all of his six years to figure this out. He has gone through six years of collected learning to come to that conclusion. So for me as a father, I said, look, you know, I have been alive longer than you. Therefore, I have gathered more knowledge than you. And it is my very valued opinion that it is time for you now to go to bed. And when I compare my years of learning to his years of learning, I see his logic is not right. So then when I shift that one more, and I consider that sometimes I figure all of my 34 years of learning and knowing of myself and understanding of my life compared to God's knowing of eternity, then I figure he should know better just like I figure I know better than my son. So when you start putting him in those relationships, it becomes rather easy. So when you consider what you should do, in relationship to recognizing that Christ in you, it's watch what you feed your mind. Be particular. Be concerned about what you feed your mind. And feed your mind 
that which tells you more about that Christ in you, that which gives you more information and more understanding of that Christ in you. The when and the where of recognizing that Christ in you are sort of combined together. Now you have to listen close to this because it's a little tricky. The when and where you do this is in and out of fellowships. Now, did you catch the S on the word? I didn't say in and out of fellowship. I said in and out of fellowships, twigs, fellowships. The when and where of recognizing this Christ within us is that we do it constantly when we are in twigs and when we are out of twigs. You know, it's like, I think Reverend Dabowski used to refer to it as spiritual schizoid man or something like that. Where everything is bless you, bless you, love you, love you in twig. And then as soon as you leave, it's slam the door, kick the cat, drive away in the car, you know, and then you're back into natural man. It's, uh, that is not the way that you recognize more of the Christ within you. You know, when I get to twig, then I'll put on the Christ in me. You know, it is not an overcoat. We're talking about a spiritual reality that stays with you all the time. We recognize it in and out of fellowships. When we are in twig, we are in the same frame of mind as when we are out of twig. The other, the other side of that is that uh, in those twigs, in those fellowships, is a great place to continue to be recharged, restored in your understanding and in your knowledge of that Christ within. If you stay away too long, it becomes, just like I said, a fact. I mean, you might as well write it down on a piece of paper and put it on your lapel. Say, I got Christ within me. Because that's as much as most people are going to recognize. Because if you get zapped, if you get uncharged from the, the reality that Christ in you, uh, it's not going to be manifested outwardly. And that's why you go to Twig for spiritual nurture and growth. So that you can be recharged, reminded of that spiritual reality. That you can see it in greater depth. That you can live it in that one body household. So fellowships are very important. It's a very important place to be restored, renewed, revitalized. And so you go as often as you can. You know, now, for some people, there are limiting circumstances, but it should definitely be as often as you can make it to get that recharge, that, that refuel. In First Thessalonians, you see some of uh, Paul's heart concerning living this standard of Christ, manifesting that Christ in him outwardly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 4, it says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses. And God also, and that's a very important phrase there. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. When we manifest ourselves, when we walk the word, it is important that we not just do it for people around us that they see. Well, here's, here comes somebody, I've got to be a witness now. I gotta watch myself. I gotta be a witness. 
I mean, you can't, you can't live like that. You've got to be more, you know, you have to be doing it all the time. Like you said, ye are witnesses and God also. And again, that's a great phrase because sometimes in your life, God is the only witness. There is nobody else around. And it's just you and God. See? And for him to say this, you know, ye are witnesses and God, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. That's a tremendous testimony of the life of this man. To walk the word constantly, to walk it consistently, to always be conscious of manifesting that, that Christ in him. You know, I, in setting up our new living situation here at headquarters, I haven't done it yet, but get around to it sometime. Previously, uh, everybody that's ever lived with us in our unit or in our house or wherever, I always talk with them and explain. Maybe after I do this, I won't have to, but <laughs> I always talk and explain that how I am, uh, that when I walk around my house or whatever, you know, that I'm going to be the same in there that I am any place and that I, I don't watch TV spiritually and that I don't take spiritual naps or whatever. You know, I don't sleep at night spiritually. Uh, I trust that I walk in my house as I walk everywhere. You see? Uh, sometimes people think that, well, gee, you're a leader. You must be getting revelation right now. That's why you're quiet. No, I'm quiet because I'm tired or I'm thinking about something or I'm watching TV or I'm sleeping. That's why I'm quiet. Very logical reasons why I'm quiet. Uh, with, with, my, with my kids and my family, you know, we... We all live, if you live in a house, it's kind of hard to just, unless you've got a, you know, a, a, a mansion where you live on this side of the house, everybody else lives on that side of the house. I mean, you're with people, you're around people, and you have to all, you have to be yourself. So you are yourself, which to us in this administration at this time is, we are, it is the Christ in us. That is our self. Uh, so it is important for us to continue all the time, constantly, the when and the where of recognizing that Christ in us is all the time. Now the why. The why. It deals with, you know, why recognize this Christ in you? What's it all going to do for you? What's it going to mean? And it's being able to leave. The reason we do this is to be able to leave the old man nature behind and live the joy of of the new nature of Christ. Look in Romans chapter 6. To be able to leave the old man nature behind. You know, statements like uh, that people, you hear people say sometimes, well, that's just me. You got to put up with it. That's just me. I mean, you got to be careful. <laughs> you know, is that your old man nature or your new man nature? Man, I mean, what is this of you? That's just me. That just me should be Christ within us, shouldn't it? I mean, that's what the new man nature is. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That we should walk in newness of life. We were raised from the dead. That old man nature was passed away, was dead and buried with Christ. The new man nature arose. That new form that Christ rose and walked on resurrection ground. That's what we identify with, the new life. That, those new realities of that new creation within. Those are the things that we identify with. That is what we are at this point in time. I read this verse 
one night when I was teaching in Iowa and I sh was sharing this about newness of life and being the, trying to relate the concept and this individual came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, I really understand that verse because a few years ago I was digging a pipeline in a very uh, sandy area and I was down in the ditch uh, doing some shovel work We'd been doing some other things with heavy equipment, but I was down there cleaning some things out, setting things up, and all of a sudden the walls caved in on me and buried me. And when the walls came down, I was able to trap enough air to breathe for a while, waiting for them to dig me out or get me out. And as the air started to leave and it became more and more difficult to breathe, I started thinking about what does my life really mean? What's what's been going on? I mean, what is is this all there is? And unknowing to him, his uh, foreman up top and all the other workers were trying to dig him out and they couldn't get to him fast enough. So they decided to bring in a backhoe. Now, if you know anything about a backhoe, you know that it's not a very delicate instrument. <laughs> it's a big steel thing with a claw on it that kind of rakes through the earth. And but they figured that was the quickest way to get to this guy. So they started the backhoe and they dug down as carefully as they could. And finally, their last scoop just caught the back of his jacket as they dug it out of the ditch. And as they pulled him up out of that ditch and he finally he did a few. He was talking to God a lot during this time. So when they did finally get him out of that ditch, he said, you know, when I came up out of that ditch, I, I walked into a new life. And when he started reading this verse about being buried with Christ and being risen with him, he knew a lot more than perhaps I know <laughs> experientially about that whole, uh, the, you know, the depth of that thing. And <laughs> the depth. So this newness of life, we have to understand the old man nature separate from the new man nature. Uh, in verse down in verse eight, it says, now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Alive unto God. Reckon yourselves uh, dead indeed unto sin. Now, that word reckon kind of throws you, especially if you're like me from the South. And being from the South, I can say all these things because I'm from there. I'm one of them. But this word reckon down South doesn't carry a lot of weight. It doesn't really mean anything specific. Well, you're coming to dinner tonight? Oh, I reckon. You're going to be there at seven? Oh, I reckon. Yeah. It just means it's, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Now, do you think that's what God meant here? <laughs> Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead in, indeed under sin. Yeah, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. I don't know. Yeah, I'll figure it out someday. No, that is not what that word means here. That word reckon comes from the word logizomai, which we get our word logic from, meaning to systematically arrange, to develop, to, to put thought process into in order to come to a conclusion. It is a definite process and working of the mind to come to an answer. And that's and the answer God wants us to come to is that you are dead unto sin and alive unto God. That old man nature has been put off. The new man nature is what you walk into. That is your new life. If you look at first John, the epistle of first John. Towards the back of your book, your Bible. First John chapter one. And verse one, it says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, 
which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us that this word of life which we have seen and heard declare we unto you so that ye also may have fellowship with us. Big deal. Who are you? With us. What does that mean? Okay. With us? Who is this guy? And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, that makes it a little better. We're going to have fellowship with us and with the Father. Our fellowship is with the Father. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. You know, I, that could end 1 John right here. I mean, all they do after that is just tell you about the fullness of that joy. But they could end it with verse 4. I mean, here's the word so that your joy could be full. Amen. Then just read it and find out. This word of life that's been given to us so that we can understand that fellowship with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ, which, is made, which was made available through the new birth, being in fellowship, realizing the greatness of what He's done into us, or done in us with that Christ, so that our joy could be full. The why of recognizing that Christ in us is so that our joy can be full, so that we can see that we have fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, you know, you talk about hang, you can hang out with the cows or you can hang out with the Father and the Son. See, if you hang out with the Father and Son, then you're going to get a better vision of yourself and that Christ in you. So that your joy in this life can be full. When, when, the, when this joy in our life is not there, when it is not full, it is because we are not fully realizing who we are and what we have and what is available to us. Again, it's just Christ in you, just a note. It's just a page in the syllabus. And it's too good to let it just go by at that. It's too good just to have knowledge of it. It should definitely be our striving and, and our uh, work and labor mentally and, and, and spiritually to understand it and to experience it. You see, it's, it's just, it's tremendous. I mean, it's like, I don't know if this is a very good analogy or whatever, but it's, it's almost like being married. You know, you can, you can have it one or two ways. You can be married and live in the house with someone or you can be married and be in love with the person that you're living in the house with. You understand? So you can know that there is Christ in you and just go, whoop de doo Or you can realize the greatness of that Christ in you and have your joy be full. The problem, as it basically sits, is that others can't see Christ in us until we recognize it. Until we see it. This year we are to, it's the, you know, reaching the world with the word, living epistles. Well, in order to be living epistles, people have to have something to read. And what they read is that Christ in us manifested out. But again, they can't see it if we can't see it. Because we have to realize it first and then manifest it out. And just in brief summary uh, of some of those keys... The who you have to look for is who you hang out with in recognizing that Christ in you. The what is what you feed your mind to more recognize that Christ in you. The where and the when are always, all the time. Just live it continually. And the why is so that we can live this life that we've been called to that is more than abundant. I remember in the uh, in when I first got in the ministry and listening to some Sunday night tapes and uh, when I first came to headquarters, Dr. Wirrell used to end the Sunday night 
service with a little phrase or a little quote. It wasn't a quote. It was a phrase that he had, used to say. And I'm sure some of you that have been coming for centuries will remember this. Uh, he used to say at the close of his teaching, he says, as you go back into your factories and to your farms and to your businesses and to your schools this week, let others see the word live in your life. Let others see the greatness of that word living and real. And again, this night, that's my prayer for all of you, that as we continue on this week in our activities, as we meet people, as we live with people, as we go out into the surrounding communities, that others can see the greatness of that Christ in us. So, Father, I thank you for this night, and I thank you for the joy of being able to be here at International Headquarters and to be able to share the greatness of your word. And I thank you especially, Father, for all that you've done for us and all that you've made us to be in Christ and that we can continually see more and more each day the greatness of, of that reality. So thank you for your love to us, Father, and thank you for the joy of this life in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. How about number 79 and sing along the way? and have a great week.